that was a really interesting talk before me. I mean, because in the talk before, it just illustrates that when we say the word topics, we can mean very different things. So in one case, we're looking, in cloud, is looking how you associate topics with users, okay? Very valid, very important. Here, what I'm going to talk about is something different, a bit more traditional in the sense of given a piece of text, how do you look at that a human being does and determine what the topic is for that text? Now, I have a, a slide deck, I have PowerPoint slides, which I'm going to get to. But typically, uh, talks on topic classification, they will describe a system, they'll describe what they did, they'll tell you their processes, their tools, what, what not. Generally speaking, though, you don't see too many much data on the topics themselves. So Topic Scout is different that uh, it has so far gotten to one system of 10,000 topics, and each topic is associated with distinct and relevant items for that topic. We're talking everything from lung cancer to hedge funds uh, to dresses uh, to social issues, politics, you name it, it's there. Theoretical physics, whatever. And so the idea behind this is that is there a way, given a topic, to be able to very quickly, very cheaply, because automation is key, to be able to extract those relevant items so that you can let later on simulate what a human being would do who, if, who is really able to look at all these lexicons and say, ah, given this text, it's about this topic. So I'm going to show some data first and then get into the slides. So this is from TopicScout.com. And it has, well, we've been drinking beer at uh, here. And this, I'm not sure how much you can see of this. These are types of beer. This is a topic for types of beer. I'm going to go over this very quickly. On the, for those of you familiar with uh, classification, on the left side we have shingles, which are essentially uh, sequence of words, which for English have been gone through through a, a stemmer, the porter stemmer. And on the right side, which is somewhat unusual in presentations, I show where these actual strings were recovered from. Now, if you look at these things, you can easily understand that there are a lot of things which are about pure types here. And we can go down and see more. And we can go to lots of other places. On the site, currently, there are about 4,000 topics. And I've shown about 20% of those, those topics. So let's just go see something for uh, weight. Let's say strength training. What have we got here? OK, posture. OK. So here a bunch of items about posture, uh, neck posture, correct bad, look posture. Yes, it's bad to hunch forward, I guess. I'm no expert in posture, but I assume, given what I've seen from topics, so talking expert, that these are relevant to that topic. So I could go through more of these, but there are currently about 10,000 of these. And what's important as I get into it is that they can be built very quickly, very cheaply, very consistently. And the precision on 4,000 topics of these kinds against 100,000 web pages, I'm not talking Wikipedia, I'm talking the web as a whole, which is pretty crazy, was 80% precision. And with that, oh, by the way, this is an interactive talk. If anyone has questions as I go, just feel free, raise your hand. And uh, if the organizers will remind me to repeat the question, I would appreciate that. So really, if you're trying to do topics, one of the hard problems in the last 20 years is to actually do topics at scale. When someone says scale, they can mean many different things. We'll get what the scale me might mean. But let's just say, you know, to scale, you might want to at least get to 10,000 topics, not 100,000 topics or more. So, you know, a human being can look at a piece of text, and as long as they have enough information about it, they're really pretty good about figuring what that, that text is about. 
And this is the type of topic classification I'm talking. Sometimes it's called topic identification. But from my sense here, it's more the same thing. It's pretty important just because there's a lot of un unstructured text around. And it, there's a lot of applications. I'm not going to go through the list of applications for this audience. I think most people probably know some of them. There are quite a few. So what does it mean to classify something? Well, here's a very simple example. Say you have four topics to choose from. You have hedge funds, jealousy, a beverage tub, data mining. OK, pretty simple. You can't. Here's some data here. It's not the full data from that site. And it happens to be selling beverage tubs. So you know, what was the topic? Well, it was beverage tub. That's the right answer. So that's easy. But it gets a lot harder because size matters. Dealing with a small number of topics, not difficult at all. There are lots of techniques that can do that. But scaling is much more difficult. Size really matters a lot. So whether it's 100,000, 1,000, 10,000, million, and more, how much can you scale? So what causes some of these problems? Well, a lot of it's fairly common sense. You know, If you have topics which are really distinct from each other, like baseball and lung cancer and salsa dance, there's a, a large distance between them. It's pretty simple to tell them apart. But as things get close together, it gets a lot harder. So as you, the numbers increase, you tend to have more and more topics. And they get closer and closer together. And you can have topics that can overlap with others. There's all kinds of ways this leads to problems. And so I, a little visual here, you know, that's pretty packed, more packed. So as you scale up, you know, this, this stuff starts happening. And so how do you deal with it? So another aspect of the problem is that many systems use supervised training for topics. So they'll take some topics, say as baseball or hedge funds, and they will have some set of training documents, maybe 500 documents about baseball or uh, cricket equipment or hedge funds or oral cancer or you know, birthday candles, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But you know, if you have to pick all those documents out and curate them manually, when you start talking about 100,000 topics, it's, it's, it's a lot of documents to curate properly. And even if you did that, by the time you're done, the topics may have started changing and may be out of date. So it's pretty hard to maintain. So automation is really important here. So topics keep changing, some slowly, so quickly. So you really need to be able to keep up. So automation is really important in this. You really can't, you really can't depend on, on human beings doing very much. So also when you're looking at documents, uh, particularly in the web, it's not so bad inside the enterprise. That's pretty bad too. But on the web, there's just a tremendous amount of noise in documents. You see, I mean, it probably don't really need to be told this. It's many web pages, like they throw the kitchen sink into the web page. There's clutter. There's advertising. I mean, I don't want to use any bad language. Let's just say there is a lot of unnecessary stuff on web pages, say the least. Uh, it's really difficult to clean out the web pages. So some algorithms may depend on things being clean. It's really hard to keep things clean. I mean, there are some available tools to clean uh, web pages. Boilerpipe is one of these, uh, but I found uh, using this on a large number of web pages that it works well in some situations and not really very well in others. So I did use it for a while, then took it out. Uh, so that's actually a problem as well. I mean, I assume that Google and Yahoo or others have actually some good tools maybe to do this. But in terms of open source or anything, it's, it's actually hard to get tools that remove the noise properly. Another problem in, in, in this at scale is just that you know, a particular piece of text may be segmented. Topics may change from one piece of text to another. So how to determine that flow and when things change is also important. Things can overlap. Then scale sometimes is just in one language. That's OK, perhaps. But in some cases, you want maybe something to scale that's going to work across you know, multiple languages. So that's another issue at scale. 
You also, this is not quite a scale issue, but it's actually rather important, is that when you're thinking of classification is there may be different dimensions of classification. You may, there's subject, like what I've shown here, whether it's lung cancer or it's party dresses or cocktail dresses or election laws. But there's also things like location, there's time, there's sentiment, okay? One nice uh, tool, uh, it works particularly well in the USA and parts of Western Europe, I think, is Claven, which is produced by, I think, uh, I don't want to get their name wrong, They're, it's quite good. Claven is an open source tool to help disambiguate locations. I'm not currently using it, but I think it's, it's quite interesting, and I, I expect to use it in the future. So it is another issue in classification is what kind of dimensions you're talking about. Then if you need text classification, now how do you tell if it's going to scale? Now scale may depend on your notion of what scale is. I mean, people may have different senses. Some may think scale means the number of topics and 10,000 is fine, or 100 or 100,000. Or scale by any refer how fast it can classify the web pages. But I think a lot of scale characteristics here are the same kind of scale characteristics you see in a lot of solutions, whether it's in Google or maybe Dynamo from Amazon. There are certain systems that scale quite well. And I think some of those characteristics are true of all good scale, scalable systems. So you want to be effective. So in the case of text classification, you want to be precise. You need to be automated because if it's not highly automated, <laughs> it's certainly not going to scale. It can't depend on human resources very much at all, which is the next bullet point. You know, little or demand for human resources. You've got to keep it really low. If it requires one person with a lot of effort to come up with a topic by putting a lot of effort in, that's not going to work. It has to be maintainable. It has to have a large number of topics with a large, has to be defined by a, whatever your target is for large. But I'd say it's, reasonable think that larger is probably larger than several thousand and probably could be much larger than that. Multilingual may or may not apply. It depends on people's applications, but if you need it, then it's important. Uh, but in the case of text classification in particular, right, one of the issues is that if you, I've looked at a lot of vendor sites for text classification. And typically what they do is they, they describe their processes, their tools, they describe their APIs. But you don't see many topics at all, which is very strange, right? If you go to a place which is about something, you expect a lot of examples of it. Probably if they're so good at doing it, you'd expect to see thousands and thousands of topics. But that's just not what you see. So for Topic Scout, a long time ago, I came up with a rule because I happened to be down working in Santa Monica and it seemed that some people were trying to get a movies sort of dressed a certain way to get attention. And it, when I was working on, on this day in the early days, I, I came up with a rule. I call it the Hollywood rule. And the Hollywood rule is kind of simple. And this has nothing to do with technology, but a lot to do with, uh, I don't know, marketing. I know a VP of marketing who actually now uses this rule. And it just says, if you've got it, you flaunt it. So here's an example of the Hollywood rule. They have it, and they're flaunting it. So there's also the inversion of the Hollywood rule. If you're not flaunting it, you don't have it. So if you look at lots of text classification websites, you will not find lots of topics at all. They talk about technology, but not the topics. And I think it's actually almost the most important thing when you're looking at text classification is to see the fact that you're seeing a lot of actual data that they can produce rather than talking about the APIs and tools. So they, they talk about what they sell. They don't show off thousands of topics. They're not flaunting it. And according to Hollywood rule, they don't have it. So what has Topic Scout done? Now Topic Scout, uh, is built on its own proprietary sense, set of algorithms. It's really not like anything else out there. It doesn't use any kind of no, really known techniques for its core work. Uh, it has a sys, one, one system of 4,000 topics, nearly 4,000 topics, about 3,750 to be exact. Uh, and 
it's achieved 80% precision over 100,000 web pages. And I'm not talking about Wikipedia pages. There are lots of researchers and they, they like to classify Wikipedia pages. But these are pages from all over the web. And now these numbers may not sound so impressive, but if you look around, most systems are much smaller. I mean, they don't do any, they don't think of this size. So Topic Scout is showing thousands of topics. And if you look at the data, uh, you'll see you know, lots of relevant items for a lot of different topics from health to shopping, uh, it has computer science in there, and uh, there are many other branches which are currently not being shown. I have, a, a, I have a one system of 10,000. And so that's the data for that Topic Scout produces. Now, how does it actually work? I mean, most of it's pretty proprietary. But at a very high level, uh, every topic in the system is associated with one or more queries. So if you have a topic for the, for the walking dead, uh, it, you enter a query for the walking dead, it goes through a search engine, it gets out some number of documents from the query result, maybe 300 to 500. Some of those documents will be set aside for evaluation purposes later on, okay, to test for precision. The rest go into data mining that produces a topic lexicon, and then eventually evaluation occurs and we get precision measurements. And so there's very little work to create a topic. There's not, you know, you don't have to, you know, curate uh, the sources. And the algorithms behind it are good enough that even when the data is pretty bad, it does very well, which is rather important because it's not being curated. The entire system has no hand picked documents whatsoever. Thing. Every single thing in that system on that website was done through queries and query results. There's nothing handpicked whatsoever. Uh, it is proprietary. Uh, it's based on some ideas and information theory that occurred to me a long time ago, and I went experimented with them and hoped that they would work, and they produced really good results. So I kept at it. Uh, one of the different things here on Topic Scout is calculating precision. So, in the case, of, let's say, even like the Walking Dead example. Now, it could be when you're doing Walking Dead, you get a query, that the query result for Walking Dead, it could be perfect, and all the documents in there are just about Walking Dead, and that's great. In practice, query engines, you know, often produce some things which really are not what you thought they should be. So it's not curated. So there can be some errors you know, in the query results. You'll get documents which are completely irrelevant or they really belong to another topic. So to actually evaluate the precision for Topic Scout, what I've done is analyze actual data and figured out what the bias was. And what would occur is that, somet that sometimes with a fair amount of frequency, Topic Scout would pick a better topic than what was in the actual query set. So based on that, a, there's a bias there. So I take the raw precision, there's a correct, correction, and that's how I actually get the precision in the system. Uh, I mean, this is, this is about runtime speed. I mean, I mean, the rest of this is about learning and data mining and slower processes that either be done in the back, eventually they could go near real time. In terms of actually doing the classification, when you have that many topics, you can have performance problems because you're, you're dealing with a lot of things. So what Topic Scout actually does, it takes, whether it's five or 10,000 or a larger number of lexicons, and it actually converts those all into long numbers, okay? So by the time it does this conversion, there's no strings whatsoever. What happens at runtime is a document is converted into a string of longs. And so by the time it's doing the scoring, it's dealing with very simple data and it can run really fast. And that was important to get it down, you know, to get high speeds. I don't have hard numbers, but it's probably in range about 20 to 40 milliseconds for a classification. Uh, another aspect of scale is it sometimes asked about is, you know, you know can, can this system, you know, actually discover, you know, topics by itself, which essentially automatic taxonomy discovers. So it can actually figure out topics on its own. It currently does not do that. Uh, 
that would be great if it could. It's a hard problem in itself, but it is another aspect of scale. It's not something that Topic Scout currently does. And that is it. Any questions? Boilerplate. So the, I only mentioned one open, so there's Claven. Uh, I, I sometimes do it in injustice because I believe it's spelled with a K, but sometimes I get it wrong. It's either K-L-A-V-I-N or C-L-A-V-I-N. And it's produced by Barraco Technologies on the East Coast. It's nicely done. Yes? Uh, the last question was, what was the open source tool uh, for disambiguating locations, by the way. So in the, the first thing we were showing, topics and topic scout, were those uh, stem uh, vibrant individual <laughs> topics? The things on, the shingles on the left, those are, are shingles. Okay. Sometimes people call it emgrams. I've, I've gone to the terminology. Your question was, what, when I was showing the topic lexicon initially, on the left-hand side, what were those things that were stemmed? Okay, and the answer to that is that they're shingles, and they happen in a lot of those cases to be essentially, you know, you know, one word or two word shingles. Okay, but they could be longer too. The system actually can support longer shingles. Right now, it's not doing that, but it will be generalized for that. Yes. So for, for each topic, on the left-hand column, it shows all the shingles, and then what I did was. Imagine that you've, you've figured out what the shingles should be, right? But you're trying to present these things to ordinary people. Most people, when they look at these shingles, they get very confused. I get confused sometimes myself, frankly. So that seemed to be a problem. So what the system does when it's finished with everything, and this is for presentation purposes mainly at this point, it goes back over the training data and it looks for examples you know, of strings that converted into those shingles and it starts pair mapping the original source strings to the shingles. So you'll see examples like, you know, inform might map then to information, informative, informs, informal even, a mistake, but there it is. Uh, and that's, that's, what it, that's what's occurring on the right hand side. So then the browser, like, the number is on the far left. Those are the actual topics. Yes, yeah, so there's a, high, a hierarchy of topics. I mean, someday it's going to be kind of a modified lattice, but currently it's a strict hierarchy. And that's right. So there's relationships between the topics. They have super, you know, a super topic, and a topic has potentially a set of children topics. A topic has a lexicon that has been built. And once it's built, the lexicon is formed as has a set of shingles. And each shingle is associated at least with one source string, and frequently with more. Uh, so, maybe this is part of your proprietary engine, but uh, where are these lexicons coming from when you're given a topic? Like, how is, how is the lexicon built? Is that automatic? Does that require manual curation? It's com okay, complete, an example, it's completely automatic. Let me tell you the, like, the one manual part. Well, two manual parts, actually. For, the system does not do what is called in the literature automatic taxonomy building. It doesn't create taxonomies automatically. So for example, if you had something like uh, an investment topic and you might put you know, retirement advice or something underneath it, right? Someone has to create that. Then they have to pretend associate a query with that. Typically, the query is often the same thing as the name, so you don't have to do anything. Sometimes it's not. That's the, the human step that's required. And it can take longer, but a typical example is 30 seconds to a minute per topic. And the rest is automated after that. OK, so you're talking about the, organizing the, the topics themselves into a taxonomy. Yes, that, that is manual. And the lexicons that go with each topic, how are, where are those coming from? OK, so I'm going to repeat the question. I think the, the, question, the question was, OK, once you have the topic, how do the lexicons occur? OK, so once a topic exists, you know, it's in this topic tree, it has one or more queries associated with that, okay? The high-level process is pretty familiar. 
okay? So since the gut, well, not that familiar, because most systems, they don't, they don't go by the queries. It evaluates the queries, it goes to some system. In this case, it's typically going to Yahoo Boss, right? It's evaluating the queries, it gets a bunch of URLs back, okay? Next phase, which is the acquisition phase, it goes and gets the data, right? You know, does some massaging of the day, gets that ready for data mining. Then it runs it through a MapReduce job, and then it produces its initial lexicon. So there's actually other things that happen even after that. And finally you get, and there's a little method somewhere in the system called finish. It does the final finishing of a lexicon, and then, then it's finally done. And then it finally goes to its final evaluation phase, where each topic then, with a holdout, usually it's called a holdout, the set of documents that were not part of the training are then evaluated to see how well it performs against that. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure if I have. Yeah, I've got there's some pieces there. <laughs> so I guess the, the queries that you're talking about are queries that can be run against a, a search, a, a proprietary or a query that can be run against a search engine? Just a, ser a search engine. In point of fact, it could be a, it could be a search a engine within an enterprise, for that matter. The system actually has a little search agent connector framework. It so happens mainly it's going through Yahoo Boss, but it could go through some other one just as easily. You can mix and match in point of fact. And that gives you a collection of documents. Yes. Are those documents are evaluated for uh, Well, then we get into the algorithms. The, you know, their, their things will be filed and described, and I would love to talk about it. I really would like to, but for reasons that are pretty obvious, I can't. So yeah, it is, there's, it's, it's quite different though from other, other things. It doesn't fall into a, you know, a, a ca, a, you know, typical categories. Uh, but it's probably, you know, it's, it's a multi-stage thing as well, but it's worth doing it because it's all about the automation. Because if you can truly automate it, then you can, and you can get effective results, you can scale. I'm not sure there was a personal question, but I think he's gone, so. Okay. So is that the 80% that you're reporting? Is that uh, classifying an arbitrary document and choosing one topic for it? Well, I, I want, I want, the question was, the kind of precision I'm talking about, is that classifying an arbitrary document and then seeing if it gets the right result? Is that? Well, and is, is that is the, the problem that you're trying to assign a single topic to a document and then see if that matches a single well, at the evaluation phase, that's basically what it's doing. I mean, very production, you might want to have multiple topics. But evaluation, I think the, the question is, are you trying to get like one result? And the answer is, in evaluation, yes. And I, I will say that, you know, it is the case that, you know, I'm, I'm getting documents from a query result. I have my holdout set, okay? So at this point, I'm not taking completely random documents from the World Wide Web, right? I have gotten documents from a query result, whether it's 500 documents on lung cancer, put 100 of them aside for evaluation purposes. And though, then I'll run, I will take those documents, and when I'm doing the classification, it's not binary, I'm considering all the other topics. So when I say, you know, there's 10,000 topics, I'm considering all the other 10,000 topics as well, and then precision is measured if I actually get the right result, which in this case is lung cancer. I see. But you, you don't test then, um, I, uh, yeah, I see, okay, so that makes, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm open, you know, this is part of trying to scale the evaluations. There, this, this was, yeah, this was a pretty good way to do it. It took a, there was a bunch of stuff that had to happen to make it happen. But once it got in place, then I actually even roll up the results on the topic trees. So I can see the precision go up. So I have a deep tree. I don't have to look at everything. I get roll up and I can say, okay, for health, you know, it got 83%, you know, shopping got 76, and computer science got 84. And I can just tell by looking at something. Because at this level of, you know, there's so many topics, you just can't look at each one. You have to figure out some way to make this scale. Okay. And if that's it for questions, then we're done. Thank you very much.